Good morning, everyone. So today we're going to look at the Vipassana practice within the Mahayana Buddhist traditions. But before we start, um, let's do a short 15-minute practice, shamatha practice, just to relax the body, relax the mind, set a good motivation. So again, you can choose whatever object you want, and we'll do it again in silence. So take your own time to prepare your body and mind, and then move to your object of choice.
Um, just two comments before we begin the presentation. <clears throat> First one is this topic today of emptiness that we're going to present and meditate on a little bit um, is quite profound and not so easy to understand. So if we have the expectation that by the end of today we'll have a good understanding of emptiness, then we're probably just going to get a lot of frustration. So therefore, recommendation is whatever you pick up today is good. What you don't understand, next time you hear about it, and you'll pick up a little bit more. So this is a topic that you'll, of course, need to uh, hear about, reflect on, and meditate on many times to really start to appreciate what it means. And the second point is because now we're in this topic, um, I think it's more helpful to be interactive, so we'll have question answer in every session today. So anytime you have any questions about what we're discussing, then raise your hand and we'll, we'll interact in that way. But of course, in between sessions, we're still in silence mode, of course. Okay, so let's start with a review. So we're looking today at the uh, wisdom practice, so remember the two main aspects or wings of practice is wisdom and compassion. And so this wisdom practice is often referred to with the Sanskrit word Vipassana. And of course, in the um, Theravada Buddhist traditions, they're based on the Pali scriptures, so the Pali word is Vipassana. And both of those, of course, the VI prefix means higher, superior. Pashana or Pasana means to see. So Vipassana or Vipassana is higher seeing, seeing beyond, often normally translated as insight or special insight. So, of course, we're talking about the insight into the nature of reality. So then, within the Theravada traditions, when we talk about Vipassana practice, we are generally talking about the three marks of existence. We're gaining insight into three things, impermanence, suffering, and no self. And so remember that it's particularly the insight into no self that will enable us to eliminate mental afflictions and suffering and achieve the goal of Nirvana. So that's within the Theravada Buddhist tradition. And we looked at that yesterday. And today we're going to be looking at Vipassana practice in the Mahayana tradition. And generally when we talk about Vipassana practice in the Mahayana Buddhist traditions, we're mainly talking about this wisdom of emptiness in Sanskrit, shunyata. And of course, this is the realization that everything's empty of independent existence. Nothing exists independently. Remember, in the Theravada Buddhist traditions, um, the root problem is how we see ourselves as a person. We overinflate the sense of me. We're grasping on to what's called self. So we have a distorted way of seeing ourselves as a person. That's the problem, underlying problem. So to come to realize we do not exist like this as a no, in not, no self, 
we can achieve nirvana. So in the Theravada Buddhist traditions then, how we see the world is not a problem. There is an independent, objective world out there. No problem. So the world exists as it appears. Whereas in Mahayana Buddhist traditions, uh, based on the perfection of wisdom teachings from the Buddha, the Buddha went on to say, actually, also how we see the world is a problem. There is no independent, uh, objective world out there. There seems to be, but if we investigate closely, we'll come to realize the world does not exist as it appears. And similarly, there's no independent, subjective me here. So therefore, nothing exists independently. This is the idea of emptiness. So to begin our discussions about this, I'd like to um, read again from another book from Alan Wallace uh, called uh, Tibetan Buddhism from the Ground Up. And there's a section in there, he talks about this, and the section is in the book is titled, What is Really There? And he says the following. Many of us believe that we directly perceive objective physical phenomena with our five physical senses, that the mental images we perceive via our senses are accurate representations of the objects we perceive. However, neurologist Antonio Damasio refutes this assumption, which is commonly called naive realism. So now he's quoting the neurologist who says... When you and I look at an object outside of ourselves, we form comparable images in our respective brains. We know this well because you and I can describe the object in very similar ways, down to fine details. But that does not mean that the image we see is the copy of whatever the object outside is like. Whatever it is like in absolute terms, we do not know. Now back to Alan Wallace. He says... In light of this neuroscientific view, with our five senses, we directly perceive images generated in the brain. But these are not truly representations of anything existing independently of the brain. These sensory impressions of colours, sounds, smells and so on are no more tangible than thoughts or dreams. While we seem to experience colours and so on as they exist in the objective world, independent of our senses, this is an illusion, very much like a dream. Having determined that the reality we perceive depends on our sense faculties, what then really does exist outside our senses? When we close this book and leave the room, shutting the door behind us, what remains? It is an ancient question that has been asked since the time of the Greeks. What exists behind appearances? What really exists out there? This brings up a familiar problem. What happens when a tree falls and nobody is in the forest to watch it or hear it? Most people agree something happened. The tree trunk is on the ground, there is a big dent, things start to rot, and ants and termites live in the fallen trunk. But what happened? Western scientists have traditionally responded to this question by trying to find primary or intrinsic qualities of the falling tree that can be measured. Mass is one of those, the idea being that the tree has a quantifiable amount of stuff to it. Speed is another quality that does not seem to depend on anyone's perception. Briefly considering the history of Western scientific thinking on this point may be a useful digression that may help us better understand the nature of emptiness. Also, by examining our cultural assumptions about the nature of reality, we can better understand and penetrate those assumptions, and by so doing, come to appreciate the Buddhist view. Since Galileo took his telescope and turned it on Jupiter, scientific thought has increasingly depended on the power of mechanical instruments. We get the sense, and it is widely promoted by science, that by using mechanical instruments and mathematics, we stop being subjective and instead become objective. Everyone knows the senses can be misleading, it is said, so let us dispense with the senses. They are only giving us appearances anyway, and we are trying to penetrate through those. 
The idea of objective measurement came to be strongly emphasized during the time of Galileo. And by the end of the 19th century, scientists felt the objective science of physics was virtually complete. The physics of the time was assumed, with very few exceptions, to be an absolute representation of what was really out there. At the beginning of the 20th century, this view began to break down. Scientists started to understand more clearly that their instruments of measurement were themselves contributing to the data they were detecting. But the real revolution came with the development of quantum physics, which investigates the very smallest components of physical reality. It is here that the participatory nature of measurement and experimentation becomes most obvious. In quantum mechanics, attributes of mass, speed, shape, and location vanish as purely objective entities. All of them can only be seen in relationship to the methods of measurement. As the, as the renowned physicist Werner Heisenberg said, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. As scientists look still deeper, they started questioning the objectivity of the analytical tools they use. Mathematics, for instance, is one more human creation. Euclidean geometry is only one of a theory theoretically infinite number of geometries that can be used. And the same goes for algebra and for various logic systems. The subjective element seems to be inescapable on all fronts. In no facet of science, whether we are dealing with astronomy, physics, or medicine, do we get even one bit of information about any reality existing independently of our modes of questioning. All our sensory experience consists of experience that are contingent upon our sense faculties. Even by reducing everything to the subatomic level of electrons, quarks, and so forth, we are still left with nothing but appearances. What is inescapable is that all we know of the world, theoretically and empirically, consists of appearances to the mind. We have access to nothing else. Understanding this, the concept of reification becomes universally applicable. In the same way that we look out on the world and view perceived objects as if they existed inherently in objective space, so too do we view things like electrons and sound waves as if they existed independently of our conceptions of them. Perceived objects exist in relation to the conceptual schemata within which they are understood. We reify an object by removing it from its context by ignoring the subjective influences of perception and conception. Okay, so let's have a, begin to have a look at these, some of these ideas. As I mentioned already, I think the other day,